All right. So, hi, Randy. Good, Good to see you. Um, so, it is my great pleasure to have uh, Randy Jones. Randy, uh, I got to meet him, I think it was 2008. Is that right? When you started your master's? Um, I guess 06, 07, and 08 06, would have been the dates. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, 06. So, I was uh, pretty new to being faculty. And... Uh, Randy was probably one of the most experienced master students that I've ever supervised because he had done a lot of uh, stuff prior to that. Um, so I'll let him talk a little bit about his background and then we'll uh, go into discussing some uh, topics more related to the synthesizers course. So tell us about yourself, Randy. Well. Well, I was almost having an easier time with the, uh, like, what was your first synthesizer questions? Tell us about yourself. I hardly know where to begin. But I guess if I want to rewind to, like, just before I met you at UVic, um, I had a long time interest in, in computers and music, but um, never really figured out how to get those two things together as much as I would have liked. I knew that the, the intersection of them could have could be a really fun and interesting place to do the main work that I do. Um, and I'd kind of been moving towards that. I grew up in the Midwest in, in Wisconsin and moved to Seattle as a fairly young adult and then um, worked in um, random computer jobs, worked in video games, which I thought would be cool. But at that time, we're kind of not the they, they didn't really. Um, flower into the potential that I was kind of hoping, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty primitive at that time and um, just wasn't doing it for me for whatever reason. Um, now there's some pretty cool stuff, but um, so that, and then th one thing and another, um, I met Andy Schloss, um, professor Andrew Schloss at UVic, and um, we worked together on a couple musical projects, and that was one of the first times I started using my um, programming more and uh, learning about real-time DSP and things like that. Um, I ended up at Cycling 74. I guess this was before some around the same time I was working at Cycling 74, um, working on their Jitter project, because I'd been doing shows then with my laptop and doing audiovisual presentations um music shows um this is kind of in the heyday of a lot of people starting to perform with their laptops because it was just becoming popular mm -hmm. um, so yeah. i was making but there wasn't a lot of good software to do visuals right. at that point so i was making my own with OpenGL and things like that and um uh all these things kind of came together and i thought well let's make let's make this very intentional and um then when um, I was no longer doing the cycling work, I, I thought this would be a good time to go back to school after some, uh, you know, uh, many years after I completed my undergrad. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So then um, I guess uh, during your master thesis, uh, you you put together, you had this idea and put together kind of the uh, progenitor, I guess, of uh, sound, the sound plane. Yeah. Uh, all kind of uh, put together with uh, aluminum foil and circuits splitting out and cables. Yeah. Uh, so maybe let's, we will talk about the sound plane later, but let's do a quick mention of that and then we'll go into the questions. And, and actually maybe then, yeah, maybe also what you have been doing since then. Yeah, that, let's do that first. Oh, okay. So you just you want to hear what the sound plane yeah. was? Kind of like an yeah, intro? Yeah, just a quick intro. Well, like you said, um, I guess the way my thesis started was something like um, physical modeling gives you such a great potential to make sounds with computers, but the human connection with it through the body is lagging far behind. Like you can make any possible sound, but how do you control it in a satisfying way in performance? And so um, I, the things that I liked that had been done um, were things like the Hawken continuum, continuum yeah. where it was very appealing. Um, he'd taken a, a keyboard and kind of stretched it out onto a, a long surface that was um, 2D. So you could, you know, play a note 
and have ongoing pressure control the note, but then also use Y to control something yeah. else like timbre or whatever. And there were things I loved about that and things I didn't like about it that I thought, oh, this could be done better. Uh, but also um, there were there were other, I've been working with Tactex, this company that was in oh, Victoria. Right. Tactex. On this I completely forgot about Tactex. Controller yeah. they had. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were there were actually there are actually many uh, many many of these sort of controller projects. I think Roger Lynn said something like the side of the road is is littered with <laughs> dead yeah. controllers. Right, yeah. And um so I thought, well, let's let's make another one. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? So, um I as a thesis project anyway, um a good idea. So, I use um I don't know how deep to get into it, but I, I made my own take on a multi-touch surface and um, kind of instead of, you might think, well, we'll buy some pressure sensors or something to start with that. But instead I used a technique that came out of um, the radio drum of, of Max Matthews at Bell Labs, which Andy had done a lot of work with, uh, originally Radio Baton yeah. uh, in the Matthews version and kind of use this idea of capacitive sensing but change it all around so instead of like drumsticks above a tray um, you have two layers of of foil that are near each other in, in rows and columns so yeah. um and uh, uh, other people like ben neville uh yeah. who was at uvic at the time ajay i think we're working with the um the, uh, the radio drum the yeah. radio drum trying to improve various things about it and so it was a great environment for doing that kind of research. Right. right. Okay. All right. We'll we'll get back to actually I I have a question about Madrona Labs later. So let's uh let's go to the first question that that's more a generic question that I plan to ask to a couple of people. So when did you first hear a synthesizer? Or probably like something that you could identify as right. a synthesizer. I was trying so hard to figure it out. <laughs> Um, but I can come close. My my parents um, had a decent selection of records yeah. um, when I was growing up, for which I'm always thankful because it's such a great way to open your ears at an early age, uh, you know. And um, they they had this one that was called the Electronic Spirit of Eric Satie, and you know, there's oh, wow. there were all these Moog records, and a lot right. of them were kind of cheesy, like um, you know let's take this rock tune but we'll have moog instead and do a yeah yeah bad instrumental version of it but this record was actually something special i kind of, kind of came back found it recently and came back to it and it was sort of on the elevated sort of um like a wendy carlos level of yeah. orchestrating some um classical repertoire for synthesizer and yeah. i remember listening to this as a kid and thinking what are these sounds mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. We you know, I've been watching a bunch of like YouTube now has so many old videos of all sorts of pioneers talking about their work and um it was such a yardstick to kind of achieve the richness of acoustic instruments. Like a lot of that early synthesizer work is how can we get them to sound more expressive and more like real instruments and um uh, there wasn't really the alternative of sampling at the time. So it, it's sort of this whole uh, sound design world that uh, it's almost uh, very different than where we are now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what was the first synth that you actually put your hands on and played with? Again, not exactly sure, but at some point I'd gotten more, um, well, I must've been, like under 16, because I remember riding my bicycle to this music store across town, which was the only place that had synthesizers. But it was way across town. So that means I was over like, I don't know, 10 or 12 or something like this. And I'm trying to imagine now what, it, you know, what the the music store guys think when they see the the 12 year old coming in. Oh, God, not going to definitely not going to buy anything, but maybe we'll take the long view and in 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 many years he'll be a customer um yeah. they were probably really patient with me but I, I went and fooled around with the synthesizers in that store and what was there was probably you know everything from it was kind of the cusp of analog synthesizers right. not being cool anymore and then 
with the, the, early, the early DX7, digital, the digital ones coming yeah. on. And then it was, it was, I remember the first one I actually bought was a CZ 101. Oh, you've got a CZ like, 101, the Casio one. Yeah. 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 which I must have been around 16 or something. And a friend was letting go of it. And I didn't know at the time that this was sort of the worst possible interface you could have on a sound making thing. So I just dove in and like made these eight stage envelopes and made weird sounds in it. And nice all on the little, it was a, it was a bad interface for those who don't know it because it was sort of, they, the, the things they had to skimp on in that era were like buttons and dials. Yeah. So I think this had did it have one slider? Maybe you could enter a value yeah, or not was, even that, but yeah. maybe one. And then everything else is like, you're going left, right, up, down, trying to right, yeah. menu dive and find out the thing to adjust. Yeah, I think it was both a matter of cost, but also a little bit of a kind of aesthetic to not have the jungle of wires and knobs that were associated with the analog synthesizers. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was a bit you know, let's make this very clean, pristine, digital thing that doesn't look like, uh, I, I don't know. It's uh, that's a, No, that's a good point. I haven't really heard it before. And I think that's interesting because the DX7 looked like a space alien compared yeah. to the other synths. It yeah. looked like, yeah. you know, Star Wars something with everything's yeah. totally flat, actually. Yeah. And uh, so, um, and no one, no one really programmed it anyway is kind of the open secret, like for all, yeah, every yeah. the every 10 that come back to the factory for repair like one had um, right no user there is that yeah it. i I, yeah. Um, I don't know you didn't meet uh, have you run into jordy sheer at all i don't think so oh, he, he's a recent like he just got his master's and now is doing his phd at queen mary um and he did his master's on kind of the inverse sound mapping to parameters of a synthesizer so given a sound find what all the adjustments of envelopes and frequency and stuff to get as close to that sound using a particular architecture and he quoted i remember that citation that most of the uh synthesizers returned to the factory had just the presets and not no uh sound kind of changes um so cool. So let's talk. Um, so you finish your master's and you start Madrona Labs. Um, so tell us about that. Uh, well, that was pretty much the sequence. I thought it would be cool to pursue the sound plane project further. And also I had this kind of overriding idea to change my work Um um, workflow a little work ergonomics really so I'm not just sitting in front of a com computer all day and it's like there's this one thing I've figured out how to make a living at which is sitting in front of a computer all day basically wouldn't it be nice if I could make some productive time be something that's you know felt more like a hobby to me um, working with my hands making stuff so um, that was that was part of the goal and I had a great time uh, with my friend Christopher McRae and Brian, also the hardware guy, um, making and other people who helped making the the first run of of sound planes, and that was those were ready in I think um, like early 2010. Yeah. So it took it took two or three two or three years right. after leaving. Um, Victoria and going back to Seattle and I was living another sort of long standing dream having this great um, shop space with mm -hmm. you know the high ceiling and the woodworking machines and ha having a good reason to have it and really yeah. loving loving being there yeah yeah no I I definitely it's been something that uh, I it, it always appealed to me too the kind of escaping the keyboard and mouse and screen interaction with computers uh and making them more physical somehow mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. the interaction more uh embodied and uh that stuff so so yeah so you um and sort of in the process i guess i i i remember you talking about it while you were prototyping the sound plane and kind of getting it ready to be um out in the world you thought okay i'm going to write some software 
to kind of demonstrate its capabilities. And that's the sort of birth story of the Madrona Lab software synthesizers, right? Exactly. Yeah, I thought um, there should definitely be some sound making thing that comes with it um, that people can use um, without a lot of initial setup and uh, and time, because uh, that's still one of the more annoying parts of electronic music. And it's like, oh, I've got this MPE is a thing now. Yeah, multi touch expression and but you have it and uh, you know trying to make sure it works from your controller yeah. to your daw to your soft synth is still often a hassle so right i thought let's just make something you can plug right in and it will work so um and they'll have sound making possibilities right away so i gave alto the synthesizer with all the sound planes right and then um you know kept selling it as a, just a MIDI soft synth to people who were um, didn't have sound planes. Originally, Alto had um, still does it, um, um, MIDI and OSC inputs. There was a yep. yeah, dial yeah. on it where you could switch that. And kind of the preferred way of using the sound plane was with OSC because I was able or, to yeah. push out. This was in pre MPE time again, and I was able to sort of give the give Alto a lot of more interesting data that way. Mm -hmm. and do it in a way that wasn't i mean you could imagine doing it a midi but you know i i was able to do it without sort of converting it to exactly some random yeah. string of bytes and back and you know yeah a much more elegant solution but i don't think many people are using osc uh with alto these days mm -hmm. except yeah the that's, plane that's interesting um but um yeah i mean for sure we we just talked about osc a little bit in class um so um and i guess um yeah so a lot of people used alto um with their own setup without necessarily having the sound playing um so was that the first software synthesizer that you did so i guess you have done some stuff before just using building blocks in max msp or um other yeah so I'd done my own shows for a while, the, the audio visual laptop things I was talking mm -hmm. about and the setup for um, the audio part of it looked like, um, you know, the same things everyone uses in, in max MSP, the, the buffer and granulator objects and things like that. And the, right. um, um, but I had, at the time I was starting, there was no, um, there's no filter that really sounded good to me. So I, I, I was able to add this um, state variable filter object. Mm -hmm. And that was actually, I was probably one of the first pieces of digital signal processing yeah. code that I wrote. And, and I you know, guess you, you did that ahead. in uh, as an external, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so I think, so one, one of the, things that I find really interesting is the uh, all your synthesizers kind of have a aesthetic to them. There's a kind of Randy soft synth uh, flavor somehow. And uh, I, I think I, it really hits a nice sweet spot um, kind of between the complete freedom of like a fully patchable, environment like max msp that's a bit overwhelming and somewhat chaotic um versus something that's very very fixed like the you know software emulator of a particular synthesizer with all the buttons looking exactly the same like it's it's even you know they will do an emulator of something like the casio one and have all the limitations of the menu diving in the software synth itself right. Um, so what was there any was it a conscious decision? It just happened. What's your what was your sort of design philosophy? That's a good question. I and I appreciate hearing that um, you think they're in a kind of a sweet spot because that's totally what I'm going for. I mean, I think some of it came out of um, the performance setups that I was doing. People would work in Max and um, 
people who do a lot of performances in Max usually end up with something that looks like their instrument mm -hmm. that yeah. they stick with for a while. Yeah. And uh, um, I thought, well, what would that be for me? And so I came up with this kind of multi-track thing that I've been playing with. And it, to to manage live uh, in performance, for me at least, like clearly too many knobs is not good, but how many is too many or how many tracks do you want to be able to think mm -hmm. about live? Um, and, um, yeah, I came up with some ideas, uh, uh, for just the kind of scale of something that you'd want to be able to perform with. I think that informed the synth a lot. Now you're, you're not always performing with the synth. Sometimes you're, you know, making patches, um, mm -hmm. which is a different activity, but I think a lot of the same, a lot of the same reasoning holds for like what, um, how many things you want to do. There's a lot of research in this and i remember when i was at uvic i was reading things like don norman about right. um you know research in in cognition and design of um useful things basically and like yeah, yeah. how many how many um knobs can you really have in one mm -hmm. area before um it becomes a, a mental task to have to remember them every time and you know the answer is like seven plus or minus two something yeah. like that and so um and like a lot of a lot of you were mentioning the kind of skeuomorphic design or yeah or exactly. something related yeah. where let's make this exactly like what we're reproducing i definitely wanted to make something new that was designed for mm -hmm. the the medium that it was yeah. on and not be a sort of recreation of something and so i didn't have like patch cords hanging down over the knobs on the interface which yeah, some yeah. people have which is, right. it seems kind of fun but and finally i want to mention that um like through years of using max msp and other programs there there's a real um kind of um bodily thing i was trying to avoid where it, it, you i when i worked with max patching for you know many hours a day at one point, I would get a real certain kind of, um, it, it would inflame my tendonitis yeah. basically that I started to yeah. get. And I mean, it's not Max's fault necessarily. A lot of programs make you, there's no way to use it besides like clicking and, and dragging. Yeah. And, and yeah. that that is something I actually wanted to avoid. So you can mm -hmm. do stuff like always, you know, scroll with two fingers to yep. uh, increase or decrease a knob and, um, Patching's a hard one. I forget. I think I, but I think I can, I think you still have to click and drag to patch on, yeah. on those machines. But it's, yeah, I think it's really interesting from a human computer interaction perspective. That's something that like the um, uh, kind of designing for ergonomics and accessibility sort of is, gives you, uh, uh, you kill two birds with one stone because first you improve access and you make it better for people to use it but at the same time making it easier means people are more engaged and um, the other thing I, I think is always the challenge is uh, which I think you also hit a very nice sweet spot is the ease of like uh, ease of starting but also the ability to scale in complexity. So, you know, the classic example would be something, the violin is a terrible instrument to start because it's pretty painful for several years uh, until it starts being okay. The piano is a much more quick instrument to get some kind of satisfaction. Uh, but um, so, yeah, I think the nice thing with alto and the other synths is that you start it and immediately you get something and it's you know reasonable and you can just play with it you don't need to start doing a lot of patching and a lot of configuration but then you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper and it, it sort of doesn't stay shallow so i i think that's uh that's pretty awesome so what was the that's uh the uh the fit what's with the finnish names oh that's a good question you know, I was looking, um, I've not, I've got no particular um, connection to uh, <laughs> Finland or the Finnish people, but I uh, was looking for a, a synth, a name for the first synth that would be unique. And um, 
you know, short, pronounceable, all these good things. And I, I looked, there was some online dictionary I found out that was like, give us one word and we're going to translate it into 30 oh, different right. languages yeah. for you. So I, I was like, finally, this could be, and I, I put in wave and alto is the Finnish word for wave. Or wave, so yeah. I was like, I like this, you know, it's a little bit, it's got, and then, you know, as far as being a, a company selling things, I think it has a, a vibe that is a little bit of um, like, you know, people associate Scandinavia with things of, of quality. So <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, well, this works yeah, yeah. in a lot of ways. Cool. When you, when you start looking for more Finnish names, a, a lot of them are, are long and have yeah. a lot of diacritics and hard to pronounce. So I've, I've, I might've run the course with that one pretty soon, but. So, yeah. So let's, um let's run through the timeline of the synths and kind of what they are. So the first one was Alto. And then the second one was uh, the second one is Kaivo, the Kaivo, physical which, modeling meets granular synthesis. Synthesis, one. yeah, yeah. And that came out. Uh, you remember? Do you 2014. remember? Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Okay, so yeah. that's so it, it took about three years development, something like that. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah. Give or take. Give or and take. Some of that is like supporting sound planes, pretty with a yeah. lot of hours at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, whatever, whatever happened, it was three more years before Kaivo came out. And right. Virta was the next one. And that came out 2018 or something. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, 16. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't have it in front of me. Something okay. like that. And, and now there's one more that's in the works. Is that right? Or is it? Uh, that's right. I'm working on Sumu, which is Sumu. A, yeah. A, um, uh, a uh, additive additive meets fm so right. you could see a, tr a yeah. theme here where i'm trying to yeah i i, mix I a also, couple styles of synthesis yeah i together. also love that because it's it's also really you know teaching now the course so this is the the course i'm teaching this term which is more on the implementation side of things but we go through these different you know additive subtractive fm and they're usually Kind of their own little castle, um, and uh, I really like the the combination um, and you, the the way you think about it. It's it's pretty cool. Um, so, were there you know could you cite any hardware or software influences in in though in the software synthesizers? Like, is there something you can say? Oh. I really like this feature in this synth or this uh, audio workstation that I included or. All right. Well, definitely for Alto, um, I had for a long time thought that the sounds of um, of um, the, the Buchla synthesizer was some of my favorite things that came from analog hardware. Right and how uh, people like Morton Sabotnik, Suzanne Chani had used them to do music that I liked. Yeah. Um, it, there were, it was, it was a cool mix of like the characteristic sounds of a synth. Like you could often tell something was Buchla from listening, but every, of course, every composer has their yeah. own take on it also. And um, the, at that time when Alto came out, there was not a good way um, of, doing these kind of they're, they're sometimes known as west coast sounds too yeah which is yeah. a funny distinction but there, there's a sort of um people talk about a west coast sound that evolves a, a lot out of the the um sort of an additive approach with analog um around and often around the buclo complex oscillator where mm -hmm. you start instead of a um you know, saw or square and then removing harmonics, you take the sign from the complex oscillator and then add harmonics. Right. And, um, you know, you can get um, timbral changes, but in a completely different way uh, with mm -hmm. an oscillator. And it's got a real, and then the, then the little pass gate gives that a characteristic sound when you kind of pluck it. And it's very alive and interesting. And I don't think anybody had done a very good hardware or software recreation of that. So that was right. something I wanted yeah. to shoot for. Yeah, I mean, this was quite earlier. So a lot of the stuff that came, you know, the virtual analog 
synthesis was not, I mean, it, it existed kind of academically, but nothing uh, in the real world. And the whole, like, I guess, even the Eurorack analog revival had not happened yet, or it was in its infancy. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard, like, even for, you know, to me, it's like it's 15 years ago and things have changed uh, quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, so definitely. OK, so the Bukla, uh, definitely an influence there. Um, uh, let's see. So let's talk a little bit. So in terms of implementation of the software synthesizers, yeah. uh, I guess there you use juice, right? I started out doing that and um, I'm transitioning to something else for my new synthesizers that I've been working on. But um, Juice has been a real foundational layer yeah. for 10 years or something now. Right. So can you talk about what you're transitioning to or is it? A I'm just, um, yeah, I sure can. It's, it's, um, I'm just replacing, um, I started eventually using less and less of juice over time. Right. And as somebody, you know, for, for example, for drawing, making mm -hmm. my, not using the knobs that are built in would be one level. And I sort of never used the DSP stuff that was in juice. And, you know, then I thought, well, if I look at it, there's not a lot of this that I'm really yeah, using can, anymore. There's yeah. files cross platform and drawing to a window and cross platform. And I could probably have less of a, um, fewer dependencies, right. on external software, uh, way fewer lines of code and external software. If I found some other combination, um, mm -hmm. and as every programmer does, I thought, well, I'll just devote a couple of weeks to this and yeah. it's going to be fine. So like a year later, I started <laughs> to have something working. I know. But yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's your own, uh, like th there's always that trade-off, but, um, uh, uh, I mean, I, I never have sold commercial software, but software mm. that I have written has been used by other people. And it's the most frustrating thing when you get bugs and problems and you can't figure it out because it's really caused by some dependency that's external to your code. And you can't really, you know, it's sort of hidden in that code and you can't um, directly fix it. Whereas when the problem happens in stuff you write, you know, it, you, you can, you have ownership. So right. it's, um, it's uh, important, but I hear you like even the simplest things, you know, you say, oh, I will roll my own. And then you realize it takes a while, but um, um, cool. So yeah, so juice and, um, and are you, so I guess you will be, or you already have, are you doing MPE or MIDI two or that? Yes, kind of I was one of the first, um, if actually in the companies, the camp with the spec, there's like, right. um, you know, Roland and Yamaha and Roly and, and like little Madrona labs, Madrona because labs, I yeah. was one of the people. And I think Roger Lynn You're right, as yeah. well, because I was one of the few people out with a controller that was actually and a Hocken as well. Yeah. So, um, um, been MPE for a long time. Um, and as far as MIDI 2, I haven't really looked into it that much. Um, yeah. MIDI 1 is working fine for me. And I think in general, uh, it seems to be useful for people. Um, you know, I'm just kind of using MIDI for, oh, here's some notes, please play them. And other yeah. people have way more involved setups where they want automatic detection of yeah of different setups and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, um, so MIDI with uh, MPE is fine for me. Um, cool. So kind of a random question. Um, have you considered like if, uh, I don't know, a company came and said, we are interested in making a hardware version of Alto, uh, hmm. we will put, you know, some physical knobs and some little displays and make something that, you know, you can buy at Long and McQuaid and, uh, play around with. Is that something you think would be interesting? Have you thought about it? It could be fun. It would be um, just thinking about the making that artifact itself and not who's doing it. I mean, it would be, um, I think it would be good for longevity. Like some mm -hmm. people like Alto and um, what's really especially gratifying to me is when 
you know, it sticks in somebody's process for a while and doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not yeah. just one more thing they got and hoped would help their creative vibe and then went on to the next thing. It's, 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 it's very gratifying um, to be part of that longevity. So, um, and, you know, for, for all the good things that computers do for music making, they're, they're not great at supporting setups no. that are, are long lived. Yeah. Um, you're always having to futz with, you know, settings uh, and, you know, worse, worse on oh, yeah. Apple, bad on oh, Windows, yeah. but, um, yeah. you know, people want you to do those updates and then your stuff breaks and then you need to, so everyone knows this story, right? So I'd mm -hmm. love to figure out a way of making music technology that like mm -hmm. a violin or something you could put in the closet and yeah. 50 years later, your kid could pull it out and say, what yeah. was this thing? I'm going to have some fun with it. And we absolutely can't do that with computers now. Um, and, you know, with analog synths, you could sort of you're we're almost there maybe right. not 100 years but 50 years is, is no oh, yeah. problem i mean even digital since like i basically went on a rampage uh of uh oppressed desires from when i was a teenager like just like you i used to go to this big store in athens i would go to the sixth floor where all the synthesizers were and they had these brochures and you know it was it, it looked like uh uh some very futuristic piece of technology like the Roland D50 or something at yeah. the time was super super uh and it, I could not afford it in my dream like the first times I played synthesizers were playing in a band and renting a synthesizer for the performance and having it for a week and then returning it to the store so I can buy all these things now first because I have more income and second because you can find them used uh for you know a couple of hundred bucks. So I've bought all these synths from the 80s and early 90s and they work. It's kind of mm -hmm. remarkable, you know, you you just yeah. plug the MIDI and everything works. Plug the power and everything works and you think could I use any software that was written then and there is, you know, you can find emulators and right. people who do obsolete software but it it is so much harder to kind of get things working that um and it just yeah every time i get a new laptop have to install new drivers for my sound interface and all this it's just a, a big pain so hardware has that uh nice advantage um so cool um vcv rack have you played with it yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, made sure it can host. Um, I think the I think my new so I'm talking about this new framework I'm I'm mm -hmm. working on um, it, it, for as a foundation for my products. I've got one product actually shipping on it, which is Alto Verb, Verb which yeah. is a little reverb that people asked, "Hey, could you yeah. pull off the reverb out of Alto and make it its own thing? We like it." So I said, mm -hmm. "Okay," and I used it because it it's the simplest one of my products so right I use it to start releasing something on this new format and i made sure that it works in vcv, VCV rack, rack and yeah. i spent a while doing compatibility testing and then then playing around with rack a little and it's it's a pretty yeah. cool environment yeah no it's uh, i kind of discovered it and it's pretty interesting and you can write your own uh sort of uh units and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's pretty clear I, I like how they have uh structured it and i think uh surge which is a software synth that's open source they recently did a major kind of version update and they split it up to kind of individual vcv components that you can hook together to make what used to be one monolithic uh, thing so I thought that was pretty um, interesting mm -hmm. so cool um, so let's say you know time travel to Randy of uh, 2008 fresh starting Madrona Labs what have you learned um, or what are some of the things you would tell your early self in terms of software development for since or business things i don't know anything like hmm. you, know, you can maybe you can't time travel but you can send an email back in time uh with a couple of paragraphs of you know things you would wish you had known back then 
Oh, okay. We'll keep it around the the software and hardware stuff. Um, and hmm, it, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, it, the soft the making hardware was way more of a uh, process than I thought it was going to be in so many ways. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know how differently I would have done it. I wouldn't. I mean, what I sort of. Like, here's an example of, you know, naivete producing an okay result. Like, I thought um, that um, when you make, I learned later, when you make a, a hardware thing, you should set aside, like, 30% more components than you have um, used in building them for, you know, repairs and things like that. And I had not that many let's just right. say yeah so, and luckily things didn't need repairs right and um i would have learned here's something really really boring so i won't spend long on it but that it, sometimes it's those things that get you i would have thought about shipping more right when you make something uh like making shipping the sound plane was a huge expense that i had yeah. totally not thought about and that yeah, turns and out like the longer you make something the more it right. costs to ship it especially overseas i spent and it's uh, not something that you have to package it in a way that protects it and that it's not like a you know very it, it it's something that needs to be shipped with some care so yeah, yeah for absolutely. sure so that was that took up way more of my time than i th i thought and you know on my page it was just sort of one bullet point that ended up being right. wow yeah this is a big deal and um yeah get it um I, but, you know, I wouldn't have done it any differently because right now where I am, I'm still trying to get, I'd love to make more sound planes. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm still trying to get back there, but to do it now, kind of knowing how it needs to be supported to be sort of a real um, thing, whatever that means, you know, something to give it good support and give it the capacity for more growth, mm -hmm. I would to put it on a solid foundation is something that I think now is going to take a, a team of a few people. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my larger goal is to grow the company to the point where I can do that again. Yeah. Um, with yeah. the thing that I figured out is profitable that I can do, which is making software. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting because I mean, I think, you know, if, you, if, if, I'm I'm a terrible person to give any kind of business advice, but even back then, I would say that to some extent, hardware is safer because there's less chance of people pirating it. Um, you kind of um, have don't have to deal with a constant kind of request for maintenance and stuff. And the field of kind of software plugins and software synthesizers is definitely a pretty crowded one. Like there is so much out there. It's definitely gotten so, there, yeah. Uh, the fact that, you know, somehow between all the skeuomorphic emulators and all the, you know, 60 gigabytes of orchestral samples, uh, sampling libraries and all this other stuff in like digital audio workstations, you have found kind of a niche with people mm. who are, liking these uh, synthesizers that you know to some extent i think a lot of it is the um, the workflow with them mm -hmm. like they're, they're um it, it's not that you know they're inherently more powerful in terms of their underlying algorithms than what other synthesizers do but i think it's just a somehow the right kind of uh combination um Cool. So, uh, all right. Any uh, any other things you want to talk about uh, that would be of interest to a sort of CS audience that uh, is interested in synthesizer programming kind of under the hood? There's one kind of practical thing you just touched on, and I probably would do it differently. It's not like I spent a ton of time on copy protection and that sort of thing, but I, I did spend a certain amount of time on it. Uh, and more and more developers I know are at least at the small scale that I'm at. You've got a company with one or two or three people. They're just kind of saying, eh, people that are going to buy your software are going to buy yeah. it. And mm -hmm. partly I think it's um, 
evolution in in the way people making the stuff think about it but also in the world in general yeah um people just expect everything to be connected mm -hmm. and um they you know wouldn't necessarily expect and, and they're they're more aware just because everyone's on the internet now they're more aware of the bad things that um can happen when you pirate something that may, it turns your machine into a bitcoin miner or something and so yeah we you've really got a whole different um group of people the people and people want to support you too yeah, yeah they want yeah. to be part of your story and your community yeah. so um i i yeah. wouldn't worry too much yeah. about the other people uh -huh. and it's it's way it's way easier and it's it's way better on your um, customers too mm -hmm. the ones that do want to support you yeah to not have that in the way yeah and i i definitely think there is um a bit of like it's a bit like buying organic. I find that uh, I, I'm much more willing to farm out money to some small company and pay for a small license fee. Um, like I was recently, there's this, uh, I think I, I might be mis mis mix mixing up the name, but Quasar Beach or something it's called. It's a fairly decent uh, software emulation of the Fairlight. Uh, oh, okay. which is this, you know, ancient, but super expensive machine, early machine. And they are kind of a, you know, pay what you want. They suggest 30 bucks to get the software. Um, so that's the type of thing I'm really behind. I much rather do that than, you know, pay Microsoft or uh, Google or do they make a synthesizer? Amazon. They don't, <laughs> but I'm just, you know, in, in yeah, general, totally. that's a, as a customer, I kind of like uh, knowing who I'm paying and mm -hmm. supporting these smaller uh, endeavors. Okay, so you mentioned growing Madrona Labs. So let's say that uh, you are ready to uh, hire some people and uh, you're hiring someone for a more developer software role in um, uh, for audio kind of programming stuff. What are some of the skills you're looking for? Um, I guess it, it it depends how much they have to hit the ground running or not. Like if they really have to start making something that's going to be part of my project that's ready in, in six months, mm -hmm. obviously I have to think a little differently about it. And I would, you know, probably sit down with the person and do it for, um, for all that they're maligned in industry, a coding interview is pretty good where you watch somebody on, um, yeah. Uh, a screen try and type out some kind of uh sort of you know easy to intermediate software problem and just do they know are they fluent in the, in the computer language um mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which one like any variety of of c i think uh like plus plus sharp doesn't matter too much um right these are all kind of the same in, in a way especially if you have a good API that you're working on right um if you're writing that API it's a little different and more hardcore but I wouldn't really be asking any, anybody to do that um mm -hmm. that I'd be hiring um the if if I am able to take a longer view um I would say the 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 interest and the passion is going to be really important and you look yeah. at is is that gonna is this the kind of person who picks up new skills and is really excited about Mm -hmm. experimenting with something and coming up with something and right uh, obviously those are going to be the most interesting people to have around it <laughs> yeah yeah for sure at the end of it and um look there's and obviously some anyone involved with the synth project or something like it some amount of like common sense and tied to the ability to listen is right yeah super yeah, freaking think... important yeah, I think this is kind of uh, something that uh, is interesting. So this the class that I'm teaching, it's kind of a mixture of some students are from the combined music, computer science, some are pure computer science students. But um, one thing that I noticed in their assignments is they they don't have a lot, some of them don't have a lot of experience with audio programming. And sort of they they will get stuff that doesn't work but the only way to tell that it doesn't work is by listening 
and or they will hear something while listening, you know, maybe the sampling rate is wrong or something that someone who has done it a lot would be, oh yeah, of course. But they're like, this oh, is aliasing or yeah, other or things you're really, the, yeah. yeah. So, and then the other thing that I think is tricky with audio programming is just, which I think once you have it down as a framework, it's kind of there, but to get there, it's not trivial is the having a GUI, having the audio playing with callbacks and kind of having the right combination of messaging and threading to kind of keep everything running without glitching mm -hmm. um, is a very different style of programming. And, you know, sometimes you put a debug statement and your thing slows down and starts click like you, you kind of, I find myself, it's taken me a while to get used to it and mm -hmm. I take it for granted, but for you know, someone who has just written compilers and databases, it's a very different way of uh, working. It is different. And, you know, um, ideally, I think the right environment can insulate somebody from a lot of these mm -hmm. concerns. Um, but it's at least important, like you said, to know when, um, it, you know, you might you might be shooting yourself in the foot Um don't you know th these at least have the broad outlines of what a, a kind of soft real-time system is and what you need to not do in the audio thread and the fact that there yeah. is an audio thread uh i've got the most of my software i run the business with is is actually open source and I, i've done that for you know a number of reasons like there's i haven't really as you well know to make an open source project mean anything it's not just throwing the software up on github yeah. it's making a community around it and you know yeah, yeah telling people what your goals are and and so on and so forth um but there's there's a quite a few people that have found this library madrona lib that i put out and mm -hmm. have contributed a few fixes to it oh that that's good made yeah. it worthwhile that I, I put it out there yeah uh, but also i keep envisioning like when i'm when i'm here programming alone I sometimes try and put on my supervisor hat that thinks, right. you know, what what if I were teaching this software? Exactly. How yeah. how good would I yeah. feel about making this decision I'm writing right mm -hmm. now? Um, yeah. So that that's been one positive um, outcome of putting stuff out as open source, even if I'm not, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if a lot of people aren't connecting with it but the idea behind madrona lib is, is sort of an audio first app framework right so you start with um dsp and mm -hmm. then you build everything around there yeah which yeah. is kind of the opposite of what because most app frameworks are not exactly, designed yeah. for audio even even juice isn't quite built that way right There's, um i can't get into the specifics of it too much anymore but um it's more of a monolith, whereas with Madrona Lib, you can down, download a real small amount of code that plays yeah. an example with RT Audio. Right. Yeah. And and makes another example, makes a VST plugin without a GUI on it, for example. But right. the advantage of doing that first and then the GUI being built around it mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, hopefully the, the audio is solid and you're making decisions. Um, yeah always based on that right yeah right. yeah and you're always like if in my i'm not being very precise here but i think you. yeah i know idea. i know i know what yeah. you mean but yeah like i always say if your oscillate or display or whatever reactive feature of your user interface is glitching a little bit or not updating as fast that's way preferable than getting clicks in the audio so if you have to choose between those two um, but you're right, like a lot of the existing frameworks uh, are designed not audio first. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's um, I I kind of forgot about that. But one of my goals, not that I have been as good about it yet because we're mostly covering basics, but in the course, I want to do more looking at existing code and kind of just talking about it and um more looking at how things are implemented in actual systems. So after we cover a certain topic like uh, wavetable lookup, then look at you know how is it done in 
uh, a particular piece of software, including some relatively ancient ones, which is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, anyway, so that's that's cool. Um, I think uh, I think we're good uh, with uh, stuff. So thank you so much. It was a great pleasure chatting and. Hopefully you will come yeah, likewise. at some point or I will oh, I'd love to. come to Seattle. I was actually in Seattle with um, my son and I saw Andy, but uh, mm -hmm. it was really tight. All right. So um, sounds good. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having All me. Right. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay.